Hey guys, sorry I've not been able to post a, a lecture in a while. I've been busy with residency, but I decided to start a series on uh, ophthalmic uh, emergencies just because I think that's something I need to know and uh, maybe I can, as I'm reading through stuff, I can uh, create something that can help everyone else too. So in this lecture we'll talk about uh, orbital cellulitis. So it's an infection that involves the contents that are uh, in the orbit, but they're posterior to the orbital septum. Uh, namely, it includes the orbit, orbital fat and the extraocular muscles. Now, you may be wondering, what is this orbital septum? So if you look at a cross-section, you'll see the orbital septum extends down from the frontal bone. This is our orbicularis oculis, or lid, it's a conjunctiva, and this is the globe. And it's this septum, it's a membranous sheet that separates what's behind the globe, which would be the orbital fat and the extraocular muscles, and what's in front. So if you have an infection here, that's called preceptal or uh, periorbital cellulitis, whereas what's behind this uh, septum is considered um, orbital cellulitis. And it's very, uh, it's a lot more clear on physical exam, and we'll talk about it in just a second, to, to differentiate periorbital cellulitis versus uh, orbital cellulitis. So this is how you differentiate them. So again, the location is uh, in orbital cellulitis, it's orbital fat and extraocular muscles, whereas in preceptal cellulitis, it's the soft tissue anterior to the orbital septum. And it makes sense when you look at the symptoms or the signs of, uh, of these infections, an ophthalmoplegia. So you have that in orbital cellulitis because there's involvement of the extraocular muscles. Okay, and you can have pain with eye movements, again, because there's inflammation of these muscles. You have diplopia. Every time that you have ophthalmoplegia, you're going to have diplopia, okay, and proptosis. Now, I'll tell you in this second why you see proptosis. And fever is uh, a lot more common in orbital cellulitis compared to preceptal cellulitis. Uh, now, back to proptosis. So, if you look at the anatomy of the globe, it's a bony space. There's limited volume and a very limited capacity for anything to expand. So, if you have inflammation behind the eye, it's basically pushing the globe forward, which gives you proptosis. Now, you may be wondering, how are people getting this? What is the cause of orbital cellulitis? Where is this infection coming from? So the majority of the time, it's actually an extension from the sinuses. Okay, the, the, the orbit is surrounded by three of them, the frontal sinus, the ethmoidal sinus, and the maxillary sinus. Okay? And in the ethmoidal sinuses, there's this thing called the lamina papricia, which is, which composes the medial wall of the orbit. Now inside these walls there are uh, these perforations and they allow, or they're the most common cause, uh, or the most common route of infection to the orbit. Okay, it's an extension from the ethmoidal sinus. And that's why about 90% of the people who come in with orbital cellulitis have a coexisting rhinosinusitis. Now, there are other things that could cause uh, orbital cellulitis, like surgery. Okay, so if you have strabismus surgery, blepharoplasty, radial keratotomy, uh, and retinal surgeries, those can, those can certainly introduce bacteria into that space. If you have trauma with a fracture, dacrocystitis, infection of the T or middle ear, those can also cause infections that can extend into the orbit. Uh, it's very difficult to culture. Um, if you do culture, uh, studies show about 33% of them are positive in kids and about 5% in adults. The most common culprits, as you'd expect for most things, like staph and strep. Uh, and sometimes in patients that are immunocompromised, uh, you can see mucor, which is a deadly infection, and uh, aspergillosis, which is seen in patients with severe neutropenia. Some of the complications, uh, subperiosteal abscesses in the area, orbital abscesses, you could have vision loss if there's involvement of the, the optic nerve, and extraorbital extension, which could be in the cavernous sinus or the brain abscess. Now, these are really bad. If you have extraorbital extension, that's usually the thing that we fear the most. The others are bad too, but if the, brain, if that, if the infection gets into the brain, that's almost always uh, bad. So the diagnosis, uh, you suspect it clinically, and then you have to do a CT to confirm it. Um, as we mentioned earlier, fever is a lot more common in orbital cellulitis, and so is chemosis uh, compared to preceptal cellulitis. The indications for imaging. So if a patient comes in that has inability, you, you cannot assess their vision because they're having trouble opening their eyes 
or for whatever reason. If they have proptosis, again, it's important. There's something that's pushing the globe forward, and you need, you need to know what that is. There's uh, ophthalmoplegia. Now, in this case, it's because of orbital cellulitis, but in some patients, you could have a stroke potentially causing ophthalmoplegia. If they have worsening vision, if they don't improve after starting uh, IV antibiotics for about 24 hours, if there's a sign of CNS infect involvement, you want to make sure uh, it's not extending into the, uh, the brain and whatever you can do to, pre to prevent that. And one study showed that if there's edema beyond the eyelid margin, and if the, if the, if the absolute neutral, neutrophil count is uh, more than 10,000, that's an independent risk, fa independent risk factors for, uh, for orbital abscess. Treatment, you want to cover them with uh, empiric antibiotics. If you suspect that there's extension of the infection to the brain, you also want to give them anaerobic coverage. Mostly, you start with Vank plus Cefotaxime, Ceftriaxone, Ampicillin, Sulbactam, or Piperacillin, Tazobactam. And if, if you're suspecting that um, there is extension into the brain, you want to add, add metronidazole for anaerobic coverage. Surgery is indicated in the, uh, in the context where you have poor response, the vision is getting worse, you see changes in the pupil, or on imaging you see an abscess that's more than 10 millimeters in size. Okay? That sort of is an indication that you know, the antibiotics that you're giving them are unable to access or penetrate very deeply and it's just something that's going to sit there. So like, just like in most places, you'd go ahead and uh, try to uh, do surgery and IND that area. Most people actually respond to treatment quite well. Uh, the most serious complications are, uh, of course, anything that relates to the brain. So if there's a cavernous sinus thrombosis uh, because of that, if there's extension to the brain, and um, you can also have vision loss if there's involvement of the optic nerve. Uh, and once those neurons die, unfortunately, uh, they cannot regenerate.